Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Deep Dive, the brand new podcast that delves into the minds of entrepreneurs, creators, and other inspiring people to uncover their journeys towards finding joy and fulfillment at work and in life. My name is Ali, and in each episode, I chat to my guests about the philosophies, strategies, and tools that have helped them along the path to living a life of happiness and meaning. My very first guest on the podcast is Ben Francis, the founder and CEO of billion dollar fitness brand Gymshark, which is one of my favorite brands in the world. In our conversation, we discuss his humble beginnings, making clothes by hand in a shed with no heating and founding Gymshark at the age of 19. And this was the moment where it hit home because we went from doing 300 pound a day as an issue in revenue to 30,000 pound in the first half an hour of the website being live. How he built a viral brand and tips for getting started with entrepreneurialism. So please feel free to grab a cup of tea and enjoy the conversation. Ben, thank you so much for for joining <laughs> in the apartment. Welcome to the podcast, to the channel, whatever we're, we're going to call this. Yeah, thank um, you for having me. I've been watching you for a, a long, long time, so it's a bit surreal to actually be here. But um, yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. I mean, that feels very bizarre because I've been <laughs> following you for a long, long time as well. I think Jim Shark came on my radar about like four years or four or five years ago, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just fell in love with with the clothing line, mm-hmm. and then when I saw that like a Gymshark athletes were a thing, it mm-hmm. sort of became a thing in my mind that oh, you know, one day I'd love to be a Gymshark athlete, mm-hmm. um, just as a sort of something to work towards. Mm-hmm. Um, so it feels very surreal that that we're sitting here now having this conversation. Um, I saw something interesting on your on your Wikipedia page when mm-hmm. I did a bit of a stalk, which said that your very first business was selling license plates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was the story there? So when so when I was a kid. Um, our next door neighbour, who's some of my closest friends, basically, my best friend and his dad, they were just massively into cars, number plates, all that sort of stuff for whatever reason. And um, there was this bit where I think they moved into a new style of number plate and you could sort of spell names quite easily. And he would basically sell them, he would buy and he would sell them. Um, and at the time, because I knew how to make websites and stuff, he sort of came to me and he said, can you make a website for this? And Long story short, we ended up working together on that and um, selling plates for a few years. And it, it, was, it went quite well, to be fair. And it was quite fun. And it, was, it wasn't it was like a direct passion of mine. It's something I just fell into because he, he couldn't take things online. And it was something that I knew about. Nice. Like how, how did you get started with the website stuff initially? Oh, so I was really lucky. So when I was, when I was a kid, I was doing my GCSEs um, and I wasn't particularly great at school. Not that I wasn't, I wasn't like a naughty kid or whatever. It's just, it just, for whatever reason, I didn't, it didn't identify with me particularly well. And I probably didn't put enough effort in. And then as a result, didn't get good enough grades. Um, when, I think it's 16 when you finish school. Yeah. I think 16 yeah. finishing school. Um, I basically ended up getting into sixth form, but it was under the idea that I did, I had to do English literature as one A level. I did business as one A level. Um, and they, they asked me to do English for some reason because I just happened to do well at it. It was the one. It was probably the one subject where I didn't have to apply myself to do well, right. which was weird. Um, business studies, and I did a BTEC in IT. Now, the BTEC in IT was life-changing for me because anyone that's... That, I mean, I'm not sure how it works now, but the old sort of rule of thumb was A-levels was more test-oriented, BTEC was more coursework-oriented. Mm. And for me, that was quite cool because it was a, like it felt to me at the time like a, pla- a practical application of, of skill. Yeah. Um, so in that, one of the modules, you had like your, your standard modules, but one of them was about web development. And it was really cool for me because it was just a case of make a website. And they gave us access to the Adobe Creative Suite. And that was one of the most pivotal and life-changing moments for me because that's when I ended up learning. You, you had, I think you could go down two routes. You either made, or you made a website on front page and you made a website using Dreamweaver. Mm, yeah. And it just gave me that basic knowledge of web development. But because we got access to the whole creative suite, I then learned how to use Photoshop and Illustrate and all these different mm. things, which anyone that's made websites or anything on, you know, any sort of digital products will know that you can't just have a website without graphics yeah. and know how to make all these different things. So, um, yeah, it was through IT, the BTEC IT, which I originally learned how to do things like that. Oh, okay, that's really interesting. So my my story is is kind of similar. Um, mm. It was uh, IT classes in year eight mm-hmm. when I saw um, I saw one of the kids in the year above was was leaving, and I, I saw that he'd he'd he'd, he'd gone on the Google homepage and he'd right clicked View Source, <laughs> and there was all yeah. this code floating around. Yeah. And I was like, oh my god, this is this guy's a hacker. I need to <laughs> I need to understand how this code thing works. And then in ICT classes, and then at break times and lunch times, because me and all my friends were nerds, mm-hmm. um, we'd go to the computer room, and I started dabbling in, in web design as well. Mm-hmm. You know, started off in front page, pirated mm-hmm. Dreamweaver, pirated Photoshop. Yeah. <laughs> this was back in the day, Photoshop, mm-hmm. CS2, things like that. Yeah. Um, but I think it's so interesting how 
a lot of people I've spoken to who have ended up doing entrepreneurial things have started from the I knew how to make websites mm -hmm. front. Um, is that something that you've seen as well? 100%. But it's because, and you see this in a lot of areas, right? It's because not that many people were doing it. Because I remember, because then the, the next step for me, which I didn't learn in IT, but I ended up learning myself, was, was app development. Mm. And I sort of, it was around 17, 18 years old. I wanted to go into app development because no one else was doing app development. So web development was cool. But like, it got to the point where... I, it's almost like, you know, when you start to learn a new skill, you learn a lot really quickly, then you get to a level, then it starts to slow down. And it felt like I'd sort of, I was at a crossroads. I could either double down on web development and really try and be great at yeah. it. It felt like everyone was doing it. Or I could try app development. I think it was like the Apple SDK, you paid 20, 30, 40 quid. I can't remember mm -hmm. what it was. You pay the fee and it basically gives you access to like the SDK basically. So then I moved on to app. So I think... A lot of people did well out of websites sort of in our era because not that many people were doing it and there was so much opportunity. And then mm. I think it went to apps and, you know, now it's sort of beyond that even. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like, especially with, like, web websites and apps, and I think now things like TikTok and stuff are, mm -hmm. where as an individual, you don't need to ask anyone's permission. You can just make something completely from scratch. Yes. So nowadays with websites and later on apps, and now mm -hmm. these days I feel like, the kids are less into websites and apps and just more into content. Yeah. Once you have that confidence that you can make something from nothing, mm. then the ideas start to flow like license plates or whatever. Exactly. And so the thing that fascinated me about the web, right, was, and to be honest, it's still the case. So I think, I think a lot of people, a lot of young kids now will look at the web, look at apps, look at social, and they'll think, oh, it's, it's all been done, everything's been done, no ideas left, whatever. Mm. But there's so much opportunity. We'll look back at this period in 10, 20, 30 years time as like the, the moment of opportunity. Um, the thing that I loved about the web, I'll, I'll never forget this. So when we first started the Gymshark website, we couldn't really get traffic there. Um, but we then found out that we could make thousands of products in the back end and call them all these different things. And Google Shopping would index them right at the top of the page for oh, free. Yeah. And it's like almost like you couldn't do it now. But there's, there were so many little opportunities like that, little like, hacks, probably too you know, strong a word, but those little tr hacks and tricks that you could do to sort of get ahead. And I, I still think there's so many opportunities like that on all these different platforms that we're talking about. Mm. Okay, awesome. So you learn how to website, uh, learn how to do websites with the mm -hmm. with the ITB tech, then you yeah. started doing the license plate selling. How, yeah. how did that business go? Like, uh, It was all right. We did it for maybe a year or two. So I did it in that period where I was finishing school and then going into university with the guys. Um, it was fun. It was yeah. a good learning experience. It was like, it was basically your typical website. It was just a, a, a select selection of pages which showed stock and then all of the sales would be done on email or on the phone. So again, it gives you that understanding of buying things, selling things, having websites. It wasn't a transactional website. Yeah. Um, you know, understanding deals on the phone, that sort of stuff. So it, it was like, it was a great learning curve for me. Okay. And then what came next? So you, so you said app design came next. How did, how did yes. that happen? So after that, it was just making apps and... Yeah. Um, I learned everything I know about app design, or I say I knew about app design because I wouldn't know where to start <laughs> now. Um, everything I knew about app design on YouTube and I just watched different YouTubers and they would do like tutorials and the first couple of apps, the easiest thing I think to, to make was like a web browser because mm -hmm. it was like, it, it took like 10, 15 minutes to make sort of thing. Um, made a couple of different web browsers. And then this is where I started thinking, I sort of built up my skills and I could do different different things. And I thought, right, how can I how can I actually make this practical? And because of, by this point, I was really falling in love with the gym and fitness. Mm. That's when I thought, right, maybe I could make some fitness apps. And again, very, very basic, like nothing extraordinary in any way, shape or form. But there were apps where you'd sort of go in and it would have workouts in the app. And then you could go into the calendar section, hit save this five day split and it would automatically populate your calendar with, with a, a workout basically and give you a little reminder to do it. And for me, it was less around almost like the product, but it was me, my sort of learning curve. And I had this aim of, right, I want to make an app. And I want to make an app that I can get live on the store. Because mm. Apple had, albeit fairly low guardrails, but they would definitely like double check that the app was sort of robust enough to go on yeah. the store. So I really wanted to be able to do that and made two web browsers, which was just basic as anything, two fitness apps. And it was basically just around getting in shape. Oh, wow. wow. So, so was, was, was this while you were at university, university or when you were like... It was either last year at high school, first year yeah. at uni. I think it was last year at high school. Okay. So, so you were like a full-time student, student doing like yes. studying and stuff. And then mm -hmm. on, I guess, weekends and evenings and school holidays, just, messing just like around messing around on a computer, making which, maps. Which was great fun. Because like I said, it just felt like you were doing stuff that no one else was doing. You were yeah. doing something that... Because I, I just love the Apple brand. 
and I would be that kid that would watch all of the keynotes when Steve Jobs would walk out. And I was just like, I just adored him and the brand so much. Um, for me, it was like that thing of, I just want to be involved in it any way, shape or form. And, you know, you'll know this as well as I do. Then you start learning something and it gets addictive. And then you start going on the forums and you're getting involved in the little communities. And I mean, to this day, I love being involved in all the different communities, like from, I mean, at the time it was app development, web development, yeah. now it's like motorcycles and fitness. But um, yeah, it sort of gave me a little bit of a home as well. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so then you went to uni. What, what did you study at uni? So I went to Aston University and I studied business management. Okay. So I'm I'm considering potentially doing a business degree at some point, maybe like an MBA. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have, sa have said to me that maybe it's not particularly useful because once you've run a business, you learn a lot more about business by running it than by doing a degree. What, what, um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think it depends. So we basically what we did at Aston is they have um, a common first year. I don't know how... Uh, consistent that is across mm -hmm. different universities and then the the aim of the common first year for all business students was to give you a solid grounding on everything so you did a couple of modules on legals accountancy modules finance maths um business mm. management um all these different things so i actually think that gave me a great grounding and it albeit we did make mistakes in the early days the fact that i knew about trademarks and how important yeah. it was intellectual property and had that basic knowledge it actually really really helped me and I was confident enough and understanding the different sort of classes of trademarks. I was getting trademarks early in, you know, Gymshark. Yeah. So it definitely gave me a basic knowledge. But yeah, I do agree. I think if you are going to run a business, then you are going to... It, I, I think they're sort of slightly separate. You won't learn the things you would learn starting a business through a degree, but equally yeah. vice versa. It, because running a business, you learn things as you do them. And the problem is, is because you, you don't know what you don't know. Yes. So if you don't know that you need trademarks or strong IP then you'll never think about it, whereas mm. the business course will actually give you that grounding. Yeah, so this is a problem we're having in our business right now, whereby I've sort of been making making shit up as I went along for the mm -hmm. last four years, and you know we've, we've now got a team of 12 people, and we're trying to hire like five more. Mm -hmm. And just even thinking, you know, like, what is a director of oper operations? What's a director of marketing? Like, mm -hmm. that apparently that's a thing, and I just don't know what I don't know. And yeah. it's only when I speak to people who run businesses, and I describe my problems when they say, oh yeah, it sounds like you need a, a director of marketing. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the sort of stuff that you got a kind of reasonable foundation in before before starting Gymshark. Yeah, 100%. But I would also say that there's like this weird thing of there are there is a conventional way of running a business and mm. there's a, there is a way that you'll be taught. And that tends to be based on the old school business models. So yes, having a grasp of what a different the different areas of a C-suite will do is, is very, very important. But equally, like in your business, you're doing something that really hasn't ever been done mm. at a reasonable scale. Like granted, there's... There's massive like people, there's huge companies that will do similar sorts of things, but compared to where they'll be in 10, 20 years, it, mm. it's it completely uncomparable. Yeah. So I guess it is reasonable to make it up as we go along. And, but but, the other thing yeah. as well, and I speak about this quite a bit, so I've been really lucky to be around some incredibly inspiring, talented and successful business people, like running businesses far, far larger than Gymshark. And all of them, to a degree, are winging it. Mm. Like genuinely, all of them. So the, again, it's like I always think about it, and this is, it, it hit me. It's going to sound weird, but it hit me when I first walked into the gym. Right, I was 15, 16 years old, and I walked into the gym, and I was trying to do a bicep curl, and I didn't know what I was doing. I felt really self conscious. I, you know, I, it felt like the whole world was looking at me and going, "Who's that kid messing around with with those weights?" But in reality, everyone was sort of working, like worried about themselves and they mm. were all thinking the same thing. And they, some of them were probably looking at me thinking, oh, he knows what he's doing when he doesn't. And yeah. it's it's the same in many ways of, of business. Granted, there's some incredibly talented people and they've learned a lot. But anything that's new, mm. everyone is winging it and working out as they go along, even up to the multi-billion dollar corporations. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, have you got have you got any examples of like when you when you realised that that was a thing in in the world of business? So basically, Gymshark has been built on Shopify since day one, pretty much. Like we we ended up moving off Shopify; it didn't go very well. We moved back, and we've had a, an incredible relationship with them for a long, long time. Mm. And I'm really fortunate because Harley, who's now president, and he's been he was the chief operating officer for a long, long time at, at Shopify. Um, there was a guy who ran Shopify Plus called Lauren. Um, brief conversations with Toby, who founded the business. And the fact that they sort of took us under their wing in many respects and sort of I would I would ask Harley questions and he would be like, I, you know, I don't know, we haven't worked it out either. And this is yeah. one of the largest, I think this is Canada's biggest company or one of Canada's biggest company, like thousands of employees, such an inspiring group of people. Mm. 
you know, there's other people that I've spoken to as well. There's um, a good friend of mine called Ajaz who runs, runs a company called AKQA. Again, I would ask him questions and he's just like, you know, you can just work it out sort yeah. of thing. It's, there's not this prescriptive rule book like some of the greatest minds in the world might not know the answers to your problems because yeah. they're unique and they need to be solved in a unique way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I had a similar moment. It was, it was a few weeks ago. So we've got, we've got a guy on our team, uh, Jakob, who helps out with marketing and stuff. Yeah. And I was saying to Jakob, all right, Jakob, you know, we need this like, you know, dream director of marketing. I mm -hmm. want to be able to basically say to them that we want to hit 3 million YouTube subscribers next year and they'll be able to come up with a strategy. Yeah. And he was like, hmm. I'm not sure they would, uh, yeah. because if you imagine a director of marketing, maybe they've got an MBA or something like that. But he, he was saying that, like, you know, you as the YouTuber, you know far more about how to grow on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And these directors of marketing would be looking to you yeah. for how to grow their brands. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, but I just make it up as I go along. Mm. <laughs> he was like, yeah, but, you know, people would literally hire you to be a consultant to yeah. tell them how to grow on YouTube. Which just, again, speaks to that thing that everyone's everyone's just figuring it out. It's true, it's true. And so we have a similar sort of thing where we were looking at, marketing but marketing is it's so many different things to different people we've actually sp moved it in a slightly different angle where we'll have like a chief of brand mm. and then marketing sits elsewhere in the business because then we would split our organic approach and our more quantitative approach to marketing yeah. or, or like a paid approach yeah. so listen everyone does things in different ways and equally i know companies that have a more conventional model that are wildly mm. successful as well so i just think it's what works for you yeah and i guess part of it is I suppose part of it is just like the semantics. Like, do you call it marketing? Do you call it brand? Yeah. Do you call it strategy? Like for mm -hmm. us, it's like, we call it content because most of our content is, most of our stuff is content, but then do yeah. you call it product? Do you call it operations? All, the, yeah. all this kind of stuff. And I think the boxes do have their place, but also just that recognition that, okay, does this department belong in operations or belong in marketing? Who cares? Like the point is they're researching content ideas. Exactly, exactly. Like when you get to the nuts and bolts of it, that's what you need to be thinking about rather than just the names. One, one thing I'm curious about, I saw your, you did a video about Black Friday, I think it was last year, where there was a lot of references to how you were working very closely with Shopify. Yeah. And that seemed really interesting to me because obviously I've been following Shopify for years yeah. and I know of Shopify as, I pay $29 a month yeah. and I, I figure it out and do it myself and I message their support once in a while. Yeah. But it seems you guys have a much more like integrated, like what does that look like at Gymshark scale working with a company mm. like Shopify? So the I think one, so we, we're very culturally aligned with Shopify. The way that Gymshark and Shopify works is very, very similar. Mm. Uh, and there's periods in time where there'll be a group of people from Shopify will fly over from Canada and spend time working in the Gymshark office, particularly around Black Friday and sort of sales periods. Okay. Um, and you wouldn't know, they wouldn't stick out. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like everyone's very, very similar. Because Gymshark has very, very high levels of traffic anyway. Mm -hmm. And we have super high levels of traffic around yeah. times like Black Friday. For whatever reason, Gymshark becomes super attractive around those sorts of times. Mm -hmm. I think it's because we tend not to do too many sales. Now, because the spikes are so high, there's been periods in the past where we've broken all of Shopify's records in terms of people jumping on the website yeah. in, a, in a in a moment. So we basically need people on hand to make sure that the website is running in a robust way because we've had periods in the past where it has fallen apart and hasn't gone well. Okay. So what will tend to happen, so Black Friday it's just gone, Shopify will send a group of individuals over and we'll be managing the website live in our office. Obviously, there'll be Shopify staff, so they'll have access to all of Shopify systems. And then you'll have the Gymshark guys sort of next to them yeah. managing our side of things as well. Ah. It's, that, it's, that, it's that amazing. Be quite exciting. It's like, like mission control. Yeah. Like it's incredible just to see it all going on because a lot of the sort of extra things and add-ons that we have onto our website and mm. a lot of even some of our analytics tools in real time will break just due to the amount of traffic that we're, that we're receiving in that moment. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I guess when you get to that level of scale, you're starting to solve these sorts of problems that... Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. That's stuff that I never thought we would have to solve for. But um, yeah, Shopify is such a great platform and that's why it works for us is they do really support us and help us during those sort of peak periods. Nice. Yeah, I actually got an email from one of their marketing people the other day being like, hey, we want to work with you about entrepreneurship content. And I was like, yes. Sure, that's <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, sweet. So um, so if we go back to kind of, you were, you were doing the apps around around fitness. Yeah. Um, when did Gymshark become a thing like relative Ooh. to the app, app design stuff? So it was 2012 when the company was founded. Mm. Um, and the reason it was started was one, I wanted a website with that with, that would tra transact. So yep. before that, I'd made the basic number plate website. I'd done all these different basic apps. I messed around with a few WordPress websites, yep. fitness forums, tried to make a little fitness social network. Mm. It was all just a bit messy. Um, it wasn't particularly great. And then it was like, right, I've done all these different things. Yeah. Let's do a website that, trans that will transact. That's where I stumbled upon Shopify. 
Oh, um, Shopify ran in 2012. That, uh, that would have been really early days for very, them. Yeah. yeah, it was early days, very basic. But it was just, again, it was just a simple solution of, of yeah. transacting online, which yeah. was great for us. Now, because essentially there was the time wasn't taken up with massive hours on development, then we were really thinking carefully about the product. And I really wanted to be involved in fitness by any way that I could. And at the time, I was massively into supplements. I think anyone that first gets into the gym, you like looking at all the different nutrition, you hear about how important it is. And I went to a a mate of mine, worked at a local company, and I said to him, I want to stock supplements on the website, what's your minimum order? Mm. And the the minimum order was £8,000 for supplements. Now, I'd never heard of £8,000, let alone seen (laughs) £8,000 at the time. I was at Pizza Hut on, it was £4 something an hour. It, It was just... I wouldn't have been able to afford that. So I sort of sat down and now sort of the term drop shipping, you know, it's, it's I think it's a term that a lot of people will, will understand. And for those of you that don't, it's basically you don't hold stock. Um, someone orders from you and basically you act as a middleman. Someone else ships it out to the customer. Now, at the time, I'd never heard of drop shipping, but I had this sort of idea of, okay, so I've got limited knowledge of a website and I know around how Google works. I know that I want a large website. I want it to be broad. I want a vast product array. I want lots of pages. I want it to index well in Google. It's brand new. It's it's not going to be seen otherwise. So what I did was I drop shipped loads of supplements from the Gymshark website, filled it up with loads and loads of supplements, wasn't making great margin, but it was, again, if we're looking back to the bar that was set, the mm. very low bar of, I want to be involved in fitness, and I want, a, I want a website that transacts. Yeah. So I'd sort of filled that, right? Even yeah. though we didn't own the stock. Did that for a while and took a few months, got a sale. First sale, I was dancing around my bedroom like it was the best feeling ever. First sale as in someone bought a supplement? Yeah, someone bought oh, something. Okay. After, after a few months? Took about two months oh, to get the hell. first okay, sale. That's a long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I'd sort of, it's at the point where like you almost forget about it. It's like yeah. running in the background. I, I think we were paying Shopify a, a few quid a month. The domain cost me, domain cost me £3.50. <laughs> so my sort of yeah. my investment costs would have, yeah. 20 quid round numbers okay. as a guess. So you sort of forget about it. Got the sale and I was just buzzing. It was a 50 pound sale and we made two pounds profit on it, but it was a sale. Nice. Um, did that, kept going, started to get the odd sale, like a sale every week and so on. And and um, basically I bought a, a tank because I was obsessed with bodybuilding. I wanted to be, I'd sort of realized I was never gonna be a footballer. I wanted mm. to be a bodybuilder. Um, So I bought this tank online, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger style stringer tank, and it just completely drowned me, basically fell through the middle of it because it was built for a big bodybuilder, not sort of someone like me with more of a slender frame. So at that point I thought, right, I would love for us just to make our own clothing because no one makes the clothing that we want. Um, Conveniently, my nan was doing a curtains course. My mom knew how to sew, local lad knew how to screen print. So saved up, bought a screen printer and a sewing machine uh, and started to hand make the clothes from there. So you went from supplements to clothes. Yes. Because you saw a problem that you wanted as clothing that looked a certain way. It was, it was and... like a selfish problem, right? Yeah. I wanted this stringer. I looked terrible in it. I was looking around online. Yeah. No one was making the product that we wanted. Um, so we did it. And it was at that weird time, right, where I loved the California bodybuilding aesthetic. A lot of the American product just wasn't really coming over to the UK. And that that was, it didn't fit in the way that we wanted. Things over in Europe and the UK were starting to get a lot more fitted and tapered. It was that, you know, top man two for £10 era when everyone mm. wore skinny jeans and little tight tops. So it was like that weird morphing of, okay, so I want to be able to look like a bodybuilder, yeah. but I just haven't got the size. This was like the fashion over here. So all of a sudden, the idea came, how great would it be to make fitness wear that would really accentuate your physique and taper, taper yourself in? Mm. Um, and that's when we started to hand make the clothes. Okay. So what was the trajectory then? So you start handmaking the clothes. When when did things start to really take off? I would guess 2015. Okay. About 2015, so about three years in. And that was when we did our first Body Power, our first event, basically. And that was the trigger point where all of a sudden it went from being this thing that I did from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Yeah. to I'm now going all in on this. Okay. And it was, it was around that first event that we did. Well, what happened at that first event? So... So as a kid, so about 20 minutes from where I grew up, there's the Birmingham NEC, so it's a large event space. And every year they would do an event called Body Power. So my heroes, these American lifters, bodybuilders, they would all fly in. Everyone have a, have a huge fitness event once a year. So I would go as a kid. Um, and then the one year that we went, which would have been 2014, I believe, 2013, 2014, and I was walking around and Gymshark existed. And this time it was it was sort of, Drop shipping supplements. We're in that bit where I'm about to buy the screen printer and sewing yeah. machine. Um, and I'm walking around 
And I'm just thinking, Gymshark has to be here, mm. like, which was mental because we had no stock at the yeah. time. There was no physical manifestation of Gymshark. And yeah. I just had this gut-wrenching feeling that we had to be here by any means necessary. So I'm walking around and I'll never forget it because I'm in a bit of a rush because I'm there on the day and I know I've got my pizza at shift at five and it was coming to like three o'clock and I'm thinking, right, I need to start of make an action here and do something because I need to get to work. And I've gone to the show office and funnily enough, the guy that runs it, who's now a friend of mine called Ollie, and there was Steve as well who were there. And I just said, right, I want a stand, cheapest stand you can get, give me a stand, I want to be here next year. What's the price? And it was three grand. Again, three grand was a hell of a lot of money, but mm. now it was more reasonable that within 12 months, I could earn 3,000 pounds yeah. because I had the job, Gymshark was starting to get a few sales. Um, it wasn't crazy. So there and then booked into the stand. Um, Followed it up on email, got it going. Then over the next year, Gymshark started. We started hand-making the clothes. We started getting regular sales. We actually started to become a profitable business. Mm. So upgraded the stand, started to um, work more closely with some of my heroes who were YouTubers. Um, and we basically brought those guys to, to this event. So we'd, we'd stumbled upon the market mix that many online people use today, right? We'd... we'd had a product that was only available at this event. Mm. We'd accidentally built scarcity because we turned the website off while we were there. Not <laughs> not through a strategic decision, but, but yeah. because because we weren't hand making the clothes, we had to turn the website off because otherwise yeah. people might order and not get them sent. Um, we flew these YouTubers in who were, again, not strategic, just our heroes, and I just really wanted to meet mm. them. Um, and then we would go to this event and we were starting to build a community because at the end of each day, we would just go and lift down the road in Ironworks in Birmingham and, and just get a lift in with... You know, me, my friends, um, the athletes, the local fans, and we were building this community. So as we were doing this lifting and whatnot, people were taking pictures, they were putting mm -hmm. on Facebook, and the brand started to go viral without us really knowing. So the event went incredibly well. We completely sold out of everything. Mm -hmm. And then after the event, turned the website back on. And, and, and this was the moment where it hit home because we went from doing £300 a day as an issue in revenue to £30,000 in the first half an hour of the website being live. And it just went, it was like, boom, overnight. Yeah. And going back to that, like the website, everything was set to infinite stock because yeah. we would never get enough sales to ever trouble the scoreboard. Yeah. So I'm there at one o'clock in the morning, scrambling on my laptop, trying to turn all the stock to zero to cancel everything off yeah. because we were just getting so many sales. Um, and there was a point where everything's out of stock on the website. I've closed my laptop. It's one o'clock in the morning. There's yeah. 30 grand's worth of outstanding sales. Yeah. Um, and that was a moment where I was like, wow, I'm onto something here. Something's, something is really going to mm. like kick off with this company. What did that feel like? Like, can you remember like, kind of your thoughts and feelings at the time mm. as like this sort of your 100xing basically overnight? So that was the period where um, sort of like I dropped out of uni like the week before. Um, you know, I was, I was starting to really dig in. So I felt like I was then taking, albeit not massive, it didn't feel like massive financial risk, albeit, you know, the stand cost, everything that we had to fly the YouTubers over, everything we had. We'd, we'd risked everything we had several times. Um, but it was, I don't know, I just felt really excited to be yeah. honest. And the, the thing that we did well, which I'm really proud of, is we didn't rest at that point. We did one great event. So then the next year we did two, the next year we did five and we just went and went and went and we kept spending everything we had mm. on punts that we thought might come off, but stuff that our gut told us was the right thing to do. Nice. So between let's say 2013 and 2015, like before this event, mm. how were people finding the supplements and the clothing? Like um, what sort of marketing, <clears throat> if any, were you guys, were you guys doing? So Facebook was massive at the time, YouTube, uh, and Google were the main three things. So okay. it was the whole Google shopping thing was massive for us. There was a change where all of a sudden you had to pay for your spot on Google shopping, which sort of affected us, but it's sort of like a bit of an evolve or die moment. Yeah. So then that was the point where we actually started getting involved with a little bit of paid advertising. Yeah. Facebook, Instagram wasn't really a thing. Mm. So yeah, Facebook, YouTube, and Google. So Facebook is in Facebook groups or Facebook ads? Like what? Facebook we... pages was the thing. Facebook pages. Time. Oh, Facebook it pages. was a thing, wasn't so it? There yeah, was a Gymshark so... page, which yeah. everyone would comment on and yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we ended up building up to well over a million followers, which at the time was just yeah, huge. That's insane. Um, and that was back in 2015, 2016. Okay. And then on YouTube, what was the thing of like YouTube. sending product to people and yeah, so, what was so the this is the thing. There? So we didn't, we've not really done too much on YouTube. Mm. And, and at the time, 
So it was going back to my heroes. The, it was those guys that were great YouTubers. I say great YouTubers. Matt, who was the biggest at the time, had mm. 20,000 subs, which right. by today's <laughs> yeah. numbers are, are quite small. They're our heroes. They're uploading regularly on YouTube. I would love, I remember thinking like Lex Griffin, who's one of the first athletes, he lives up in Manchester. I remember thinking, I'd love Lex to try on our, ta our top, try on our tank and give us some feedback. Yeah. And then he just happened to wear it on YouTube. And that's where I think YouTube really kicked off for us. We're going to take a very quick break to introduce our sponsor for this episode. And that is Brilliant. I've been using Brilliant for the last two plus years. They're a fantastic platform for learning maths, science, and computer science with engaging and interactive online courses. And the great thing about Brilliant is that they really teach stuff from a very first principles based approach. It's almost like the way that we were taught in places like Oxford and Cambridge, where you learn a concept and then you apply the concept to an interesting problem rather than just being spoon fed stuff like we initially learned in school. My favorite courses on Brilliant are the computer science ones, uh, as some of you guys might know I was torn between applying to medicine and computer science. I went for medicine in the end, but I always had an affinity to computer science and taking the courses on Brilliant, like their introduction to algorithms and their introduction to Python, really helped me get more of a grasp of computer science than I've ever had before. It's also great for learning how to code, which is an incredibly useful skill to have, especially if you want to start a business. And I attribute like 98% of my business success to the fact that I learned how to code when I was in secondary school. So if you want to check out the courses on math, science and computer science, then head over to brilliant.org forward slash deep dive and the first 200 people to sign up with that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So thank you, Brilliant, for sponsoring this episode. And so while while all this was happening, you were working at Pizza Hut? Yes, so I ended up quitting Pizza around around the event. Around, around the event when things yeah. really started to take off. Yeah, and I quit Pizza and university around the same time. So it was a little yeah. bit like, I remember my mum my and dad being a little bit like, are you sure this yeah. is what you want to do? And it's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go and give it a go. So one, one of the questions I get all the time, and I know you've, you've recently done a video about this, is yeah. like, how, how do you have time to do all these things? So, mm -hmm. you know, early days of Gymshark, you're running this business on the side, you're working yeah. at Pizza Hut, you're at uni. Yeah. Like, what was, your, what was your time management looking like at the time? Well, I just want to say, so my time management then and now are vastly different, just completely different. Mm. So back then it was university, which... I mean, uni university, it's like, it's not like a solid nine yeah. till five, is it? Like you'll have busier days and quieter days. So basically university in the day, pizza hut shifts would always be ten, uh, five till 10, mm. normally half 10, latest 11 by the time you sort of washed up. Cause as a driver, you do the pot wash when you're in the, in the building. And then it would be 10 or 11 onwards. I would work on Gymshark. Now as Gymshark started to grow, we'd have live chats, emails and stuff. So Pizza Hut was great for me because I could do a delivery, then sit in my car, respond to two or three emails, yep. and then carry on. So I'm doing two things at the same time. And yep. that was that period where, I think it was the iPhone 3GS. I think it was my first iPhone. And I, I got my hands on one and I'm like buzzing because I can literally work on the go. So yep. I was like almost doing two jobs at once whilst I was at Pizza Hut, which was absolutely brilliant for me. Nice. And what does your time management look like now? <laughs> Incredibly <laughs> well just scheduled, organized, everything down to the second. Okay. It's, it's, it's actually really cool. And for me at the start, it was really difficult to get used to because I just loved the whole thing of mm. doing whatever the hell I want when I wanted to do it. But now I've learned to be really disciplined. Um, and essentially, because I am horrifically unorganized, essentially outsourcing that to people who are incredibly well organized and absolutely love doing that sort of stuff. Um, it's great for me because I, you know, I, I basically wake up and it's like a set of train tracks, right? Every minute pretty much from seven or eight in the morning tends to be planned until seven or eight on the evening. So what does that look like on a standard day? <laughs> like what does a day in the life of Ben Francis look honestly, like? Honestly, it varies yeah. so much. It's, it's yeah. well different now because I'm not traveling. Yeah. So it's actually really, it's simple because it's like there's one moving part. Whereas before moving around, yeah. we've got offices in Hong Kong, Mauritius, Denver, events that we would do all over the world. It, yeah. was, it was manic. Now it would be, I'd usually... I usually try and get into the office around seven, half seven, basically just meetings throughout. It could be, there'll be a particular day, for example, with one-on-ones in the team. So people that I work directly with, yeah. um, there'll be certain projects that I'm working on. And then we may be on, there'll be certain days allocated to those things. Um, once a week or every other week, I'll be in London. So mm -hmm. they'll sort of batch up the London meetings and do all the London meetings on a particular day. I'll get involved with all sorts of different things, whether it's, uh, you know, content on my YouTube. The only thing I would say is now it's changed because I'm moving into a CEO role. So I'm now just one step slightly more removed. Whereas previously it would be product and um, or brand. Whereas now I'm chatting with the people that are doing those things, which mm. is again, it's just a slightly different thing to get used okay. to. Okay. Yeah, we'll come back to the CEO thing in a bit because I really, mm. really, really, really want to kind of ex explore that. Um, so going back to sort of imagining kind of 2014, 2015 before the, the, the NEC show, 
What did the team look like in Gymshark? Ooh. There was um, myself and Lewis, who started the business. Mm. There was my brother. So we'd around 2015. I think it was my brother. So basically, my brother was the first employee. And the whole thing of Joe joining the business was, we're at the event. We need someone back at the... Um, yeah. Back at the... Um, the, the ranch to sort of manage the stock. And then that was it really. Like a few friends ended up joining and doing, you know, bits here and there. Um, but it was just everyone would just get involved in everything. Yeah. Like if there was a busy day, we would jump on customer service. Like everyone would finish the end of the day, sat in a circle on their laptops and they would answer customer queries. Um, so it really varied. I just remembered, by the way, it was 2012, not 2015, that we did that first event. 2012, oh. 2013. So oh. it was around that sort of era. Okay. Yeah. That place. So you had a sort of a team of maybe three or four people. Yeah. So it, it was in that first event, it was like yeah. two or three. And then as it developed, then it was like, okay. And then we'd started to invest more in the warehouse because yeah. we had our own warehouse and we would ship our own product. Okay. Then people would basically manage customer service and deliveries and stuff. At what point did you get the warehouse? Like, that must have been a big expense. <laughs> yeah, so 2012, 2013, just before that first event, that yeah. was when we got, like, a shed, basically. Right, <laughs> okay. Honestly, and that, so it was yeah. it was actually not not particularly great. It was, a, it was a shed on an industrial estate, and I didn't realise until about three or four months in, the whole thing was built out of asbestos. Oh, no. <laughs> and, like, the bloke next door, like, this lovely lad, like, 80 yeah. years old he was, he was just, like, drilling through the walls, through the asbestos walls, and all yeah. asbestos was just flaking everywhere, so... That's probably not great for my health. Um, so it was an old asbestos shed in the middle of nowhere on an industrial estate, and it cost us about 300 quid a month, I okay. think. 250, 300 quid a month. Okay. Then after that, we ended up going into a more professional sort of place. We went from, that was 300 square feet, and then the next one we actually upgraded to three, a 3,000 square foot warehouse. And what was great about that is it had a small room um, at the front of it with a radiator in. And okay. if anyone's work worked in like a, a shed through the winter, it was ice cold so to have a radiator it was amazing because what we used to have to do we'd have the front door of our old shed yeah. we'd leave the door open and we'd stick a diesel sealy heater in there so you go over next door you get your diesel from the pump and you basically you'd fill it up and then it would just blast heat in there but again <laughs> sat in an asbestos shed yeah. with a diesel heater blowing at you is not the most exciting yeah. way of spending your no. <laughs> late teenage years or early 20s so and to have a radiator was game changing the radiator was game changing yeah. right and I guess, it was it you and your mates making the clothes? Yes. Like hand making the clothes? Yeah, yeah. So Like getting cloth and like cutting it up. And so this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the sewing would be done at home, yeah. essentially. And then we would print uh, generally at the, at the um, I don't know what you call it, warehouse. Wow, okay. So well, when you're in those early days and you're investing in things like the radiator, the warehouse and stuff. Yes. Um, what's going through your mind in terms of like the profitability of this? Like. Don't think about anything like that. Okay. Didn't think, like, I had no idea how to pay taxes. I had no idea about finances. All we knew was more was coming in than was going out. Okay. And everything beyond that is just, at the time it was fluff. Clearly now that's not the case. Mm. Um, but it was, everything was purely instinctive. Everything at the start. Okay. So you start off as like a band of, band of brothers, like, you know, mm -hmm. a handful, handful of people in a shed. Yeah. A radiator is a game changing expense, yeah. a game changing addition to the business. And... Now, Gymshark is a billion plus dollar company. Mm -hmm. You're the new CEO of it. Like, mm -hmm. how, how many employees do you, do you know? Uh, we're just over 700. 700. And you sell all, the, all over the world with mm -hmm. offices all, over, all around the world. That's got to feel pretty wild. Like. It's cool. It's cool. Honestly, I still walk into the HQ. So we've got yeah. the gorgeous HQ and there's the sort of the big logo on the front. Over the road, we've got our lifting club. So yeah. We've got like a gym, manufacturing facility, studios. I, I do walk in and... Uh, like I do still get goosebumps because it's it's such an amazing place and there's there's a buzz like you've got to visit because as soon as you walk in the door there's a buzz there and yeah. everyone's lovely everyone's pulling in the same direction everyone really understands why we do what we do yeah. everyone understands the area that they sort of fit in with that sort of wider plan okay. it's it's such a lovely place to be so it's interesting you say that like everyone's pulling in the same direction because I think I feel like this is an issue we're having as we expanded from three people to 12 people, mm -hmm. whereby I'm now having starting to do things like defining our vision and yes. where do we want to be in X number of years and KPIs and goals and all this stuff that in the past I would have thought this is all just corporate bullshit, like who cares about any of that? Mm -hmm. um, presumably, like, like, what was your journey through kind of being more businessy about it? So what you're going through, yeah, so we did that. I used to hate the word corporate. Yep. And you're going through, from reading between the lines, 
what I actually think is the most difficult change, and I think this is one of the most difficult things for any entrepreneur or business person. And by the way, not even owning your own business. If you're running or working in a great business, it's so difficult to sort of distribute that control. And I think those that can do that, then after that, it's not plain sailing, but if you've then done that, it's like, you know, it's like a muscle memory, right? If you continue to do that, I think scaling becomes so much easier. Okay. Um, I'll give you, so my sort of breakdown, I sort of break it down into three areas. And I think every great business person needs to reinvent themselves over and over again. So you can't become too like tied in or emotionally attached to sort of, I'm going to say who you are mm. in many respects. So at the start, I found I had a great creative vision. I had, an ex I had a great idea of where, where I wanted us to be. And I, I felt like I dragged the business to where I wanted us to be. And that sounds a bit sort of direct, but you know, it could be having a great creative vision. It could mm. be great at knowing products. It could be great at whatever it is, but you, because you tend to be a one man band or there's not many people involved, mm. you just do what the hell you want, yeah. when you want, and it's very instinctive. Yeah. Now, you'll then get to a stage where you've got people around you. It might be five people, it might be 10 people, it might be 30 people. And an instinctive way of running things is still great, mm. but you can't just do things on a whim because you fancy it. You have to then learn to work in a team, and I don't mean, when I say in a team, I mean you are part of the team, and anyone that's managed a team knows that the team doesn't work for you, you work for them, and you need to make sure that you're really understanding how to work with each different type of people, uh, person. So yeah. some people will love to be organized, and they will love lots of different catch-ups, and you know, some people will be highly creative, some people will be highly logical, some people you'll have to spend six weeks trying to buy them into a new idea, new idea. Some people have to spend six seconds and it's about learning how to work with all these different people. So you've gone from dragging the business to where you wanted it to be, yeah. learning to work with new people. And then that's, it sounds like to a degree what you're going through mm. slash the next stage, which is like, okay, you know how to work with people. How do we galvanize them around a vision or a mission? How do we make them understand where they fit in with that? How do we make them understand that you know, the team that we're working with, touch what is greater than the sum of its parts and really understanding how to articulate yourself and your vision um, and essentially learning how to inspire people. Mm. And I think that's, again, it's very tough. And I hear people a lot of the time saying like, oh, you know, one facet of their personality, oh, that's just me, what am I like? Uh, I'm a bit unorganized. Well, yeah. when you're at that level, there's, there's, not an ex there's no excuse for being unorganized. Like, mm. yes, I am unorganized, but you do something about it. You either fix it yourself or you build the team in a way that negates that weakness. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah. And it's, it, it's um, I think it gets a bit more serious at that point. And yeah. yeah, you have to learn new skills. And to be honest, that's why I love the job so much and feel like I've got the best job in the world because you're constantly learning new things and constantly reinventing yourself. It sounds like that's what you're going through now a bit. Yeah, it seems like a real, a real shift in where my default used to be. I want to do something, all right, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I want to do something, okay. Let's figure out why I want to do this thing. Let's figure yeah. out like what the actual like what good looks like. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out who I can give, give this project to. Let's give them ownership over it in a way that they'll they'll feel more, more motivated to do it. I mean, kind of get out of the way and be there to kind of consult them if they need it, but not like step on their toes too much. Do you know, do you know yeah. what the most exciting thing about that period is? Right, you'll have it. There'll be there'll be a few things that will happen, and it happened to me. Someone will do something. You'll trust them with it. They'll do it poorly, and it will break your heart. Yeah but someone will do something that you didn't think was the right thing to do and it will be infinitely better than any ideas that you would have come up with. And that is one of the most fulfilling and incredible experiences ever because then you're like, okay, now we're a team. Yes. Yeah, I've had that, I've had that, I've had that a few times. Um, I often describe this feeling when, because I, I, I teach people how to be, how to be uh, part-time YouTubers mm -hmm. and one of the things I'm very bullish on is to outsource editing. Like yes. ASAP. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everyone is very resistant. Oh, but I like editing. I like doing it myself. I, yeah. I, I enjoy spending 20 hours a week doing my editing. And I'm like, but guys, the moment you outsource editing, like just that feeling when you upload raw footage of yourself mumbling through a video on Google Drive, mm -hmm. and the next day you get back an edited video and it's actually really it's good. good. It just like blows your mind. And then you think, yeah. oh my God, like I've just, like my, my, my whole world is now open. Mm -hmm. And I guess what you're describing is that at scale when yeah. you have a team that can execute stuff. Exactly. Like I said, and I, I love it. I love working with so many different types of people. And there was a there was a point uh, a few years ago, basically, when I, I moved into a role as the chief marketing officer at Gymshark. Mm. And chief marketing at the time was all your quantitative marketing. It was all your social media. And it was all data. And I remember going into this role thinking, love marketing, love social media. Not a clue where to start with data. And yeah. to be honest, it sounds a bit boring. Mm. But I ended up working with a data team. 
And that, that ended up being the team I loved working with the most because they would run rings around me at the start. Mm. And like I would come in with all my stupid, irrational ideas that mm. just made no sense and would have flopped instantly. And they would challenge me and it made me a better person and in terms of sharpening up my ideas and my concepts. But equally, it meant that I learned the power of what they do and you know the validity of it. So it was massively fulfilling to me to yeah. work with a team that I didn't expect to enjoy working with or be good at working with and to be able to do that. Nice. So when you're when you're the kind of found, founder of the business and like the owner of the business, how did you kind of get to that point where your role was chief marketing officer rather yeah. than straight to CEO? Like what was what was going through your mind there? So we we started to the, the business grew rapidly, right? We went from I mean, we've gone from bedroom to half a billion dollar revenue in eight, eight years, I think it was. It was like rapid, rapid growth. So during that growth period, it becomes very evident that things start breaking if you don't have great people yeah. to manage these things. So we, what we started to do was we built essentially a chief's team of yeah. individuals that manage and run the different areas of the business. So okay. a chief product officer, chief brand officer, you know, uh, people, finance, all these different things. And it, it's it's just through necessity. It's less of a case of, uh, listen, I think I huge applause to a business that can see ahead and build that team out uh, in front of themselves. We were just at the point of, we need strength in this business, otherwise things are gonna fail. Okay, and so when you were bringing people on, you were bringing on like C-level people yeah. for like executive roles and for the people in HR and finance and legal and yes. the whole shebang. And we were, and it was a balance, right? So yeah. some people we were bringing in with brilliant experience. And then we were also identifying great people in the business that were yeah. hugely devoted to the business, incredibly intelligent and competent that would then basically be able to make that leap up to that level as well. So there's a brilliant blend of sort of um, experience and inexperience in that team as well. Okay, how did, how did you, because I, I guess you were the one doing the hiring initially. Yes. How did you get, so, and I, I ask, this is a problem I'm having, like, how do you hire for a role that you don't have experience in where you're trying to hire someone who is like good, um, good at that role, <laughs> it, if you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so we, yeah. I was really lucky. So I, so our, our sort of current um, sort of outmoving CEO, Steve, um, he joined the business purely on gut instinct because it felt like he was the right person to, to be in the business. And conveniently, he was brilliant at all the things that I was bad at. Yep. So that one hire then allowed every other hire in finance, ops, logistics, yeah. all the back end of the business then went through him rather yeah. than the front end ones that uh, went through me. So it was like one solve for um, everything beyond that, which was massive. Mm. So were you, like, what were you looking for when you hired Steve? Like, what was his role initially? So I wanted someone that would basically help, we're going to say, professionalise the business. Because at yep. the time, it was just there was no hierarchy, no structure. A group of people that, you know, went in, did a bit of brand on the morning, bit of social media, yep. event here and there, package <laughs> on the evening, answer your emails and go to bed. It was it was literally just carnage yep. and chaos, as I think all businesses are at the, in the early days. And then he came in and he had genuine corporate experience. However, it didn't come across like corporate experience. He wasn't like, you know your typical corporate guy, suited and booted sort of thing. He'd worked in in Reebok, um, but he also, even though he didn't understand social media particularly well, he understand the he understood the power of brand and growing a robust business um, and a great brand. So we sort of got comfortable with him and he, he ended up doing, I think it was a day a month and two days a month and three days a month. And it was a very organic sort of shift into him joining the business full time. Oh, so he started yeah. off as like a coach consultant type. Yeah, exactly that. So it wasn't like, boom, you're in, in the business oh, every single day. Okay, yeah. And that really, really helped us because it allowed us to get comfortable with him, him to get comfortable with us, and just to get to one, uh, know one another. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I've got a, a couple of uh, kind of business coaches type people now who are mm. mentors who have been doing this for a few years. And I meet with them maybe once every other week. Yeah. And every time I talk to them, it's like, oh, my, my mind gets blown by yeah. just all of the stuff that, all of the unknown unknowns that I just didn't mm -hmm. realize. Um, things like, you know, restructuring our organizational chart and how when you have the, you know, there was, there was a, bit, a time, I think it was about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. where I was, I was chatting to this guy's name, Rohan. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, at the moment, this is what the business looks like. It looks like this. And it just felt, felt a bit like a bit of chaos. Mm -hmm. And within about half an hour, he just asked a load of questions and we kind of on that whiteboard over there just like yeah. drafted out this structure, which just made so much sense and brought so much clarity. Yeah. I was like, I can't believe how much clarity I've now got in my mind from just drawing this diagram on a board. It's so good. It makes such a difference. But you'll find like if when you work with 
genuinely brilliant people like that they they revolutionize like mm. teams businesses brands everything like so many people talk about all the different nuts and bolts of businesses and brands but ultimately it's literally just people it mm. comes down to people and it's so important that you understand how to work with people and you know work with great people i am um, similarly i was chatting to someone the other week and i was talking about that he was he worked with one of the most successful business people of sort of like my parents generation and i just said Right, what do they do in a sentence, like cut all the bullshit sort of thing, one sentence, what do they do really well? And they said they attracted great people mm. and then left them alone. And <laughs> yeah. I just thought that was so cool. And I think, you know, in its most simplistic form, that's what any great entrepreneur or business person does. Mm. And they do it in different ways. So some people attract through insane levels of competency. Some people do it through charisma. Some people do it through being an incredible creative or an incredible organizer or all these different things. But ultimately, it just does come down to that. Nice. Okay, so you were a chief marketing officer for, for how long, uh, Jim Shock? Oh, God, I don't know. I haven't got a clue. Have year, you... two years, okay. something like that. Well, well, what was your role before then? Uh, so I did chief of brand. Yeah. Then I came out of brand, a guy called Noel did it. Then yeah. I sort of, I moved around and messed around with product for a little bit. And that, mm. was, that was a great period for me because that was where I was like really in the nuts and bolts. And I didn't yeah. actually have a job. And I'll never forget this. We wanted to... There was a particular product that we wanted to make and I was typically I'm I'm quite impatient and it was a case of like you can either wait for these guys for six weeks to make it or we can jump on a, tra a, a plane fly over to Istanbul spend a week in Istanbul <laughs> sit in the factories and make it and I'm like yeah. too fucking right I'm doing that do you yeah. know what I mean so it was like that sort of really impulsive role product brand moving around events um, I then went from that into the chief marketing role Marketing was great because I worked all with social, which I had done anyway. I worked with the data team and really understood data. Um, and then I went from there into, I did chief product officer for a little bit, a little bit of work in tech. And this is where I am today. So when you're like, this is your company, mm -hmm. right? So do you, are you applying for the position of CMO or are you just saying, Steve, I want to be CMO? Like, wh what does that look like? <laughs> yeah, so it depends. So some of them, so CMO, I was... I was definitely the, the right person for the role. Mm. Um, I went into product out of necessity. I wasn't, like, I, I mean, I, in terms of immediately available, basically we found someone, we did the whole interview process, we mm. found someone who was brilliant, but they had like a really long period of time before they could join the business. So it was, it was like, it was like a 12 month period basically where no one does the role yep. or I do the role. So it was more out of necessity. Marketing and brand, it was like, it was my bag. Mm. Products, and then my limited time in tech, it was more out of necessity, if I'm honest. Okay. And then, so this transition for, for you now being CEO, mm -hmm. what's what's the story there? What's, what's that been like so far? Been amazing. So um, two years ago, Steve mentioned to me that he thought Jim Sharp needed a different type of CEO to take it to that next level. Okay. Um, at the time, I didn't think he was right. Now I do. Mm. Um, so he's got great foresight there. So I then spent two years working as best I could to get into a position where I was the right CEO. Because again, okay. Steve Steve would basically say like, you need to be, he, he genuinely thought I was the right person and, and competent enough to do the role, yeah. but I needed to really prove it. Mm. Um, and the alternative was to hire someone else. Now, fortunately I got to the level of being able to do the role. Okay. So two years of making sure I could speak publicly, talk to camera, understand a profit and loss properly, understand, you know, long-term strategic decisions and working with teams and all that mm. sort of stuff, which again, going to the different chiefs roles that I've done, it gave me incredible grounding across the business, which really helped. And then more recently, the sort of official transition started May 1st and it completes August 1st. And we're, we're what, July now, middle yeah. of July. So I'm about two or three weeks away from like officially completing that handover. So two years worth of kind of like training to be the CEO. Yes, of like every single day, like writing a list of things I need to do, working towards them. Um, the wallpaper on my phone would talk about the things I need to get better at. Yeah. Just every single day working towards that. Wow. And I guess like... But the, weirdly not having to, not being able to tell anyone, which is like really weird. So yeah. we're not really wanting to tell anyone either. Yeah. Like why didn't, why, why didn't anyone tell you? Was... Because it... But, so listen, I'm yeah. more than happy to talk about my ambitions usually, but the CEO one, I didn't want people to go, oh, Ben's just going to get it because he wants it sort of yeah. thing. It was it was literally a case of this is Steve's decision. It's yes. solely Steve's decision. So I didn't want that to be, you know, out there as it were. I wanted to okay. work, almost like work on my craft in silence and and yeah. and then almost people then almost be going, Ben, you should be doing that role mm. rather than me telling them. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I guess it you 
you must care about the brand a lot to not put yourself in that position just by default mm -hmm. and knowing that you've got all these weaknesses that, weaknesses that you want to work on. Yes. I, well, clearly yeah. it's like my baby, isn't it? Yeah. I love it more than anything, yeah. Yeah, because that was the thing that I was I was most intrigued by of when when I first started stalking you a few years ago. So like, oh, mm -hmm. I, I I would have just assumed you were the CEO, mm -hmm. um, but now I think that I've got a bit more experience in business, and like, I wouldn't want to be a CEO right now because I know that yes. it would just, it would just be an absolute shit show. <laughs> and it's like, so this is the thing, and I talk about this a lot, right? So Steve came in and he was the best person to be the CEO. So anyone that has an interest in self development mm. would jump at this chance because. Usually, there's a decision where you focus on your strengths or you work on your weaknesses, and it's it's very difficult to do both mm. in like a in like an efficient way. Because Steve was so good at all my weaknesses and running the business, I could focus on my strengths and then have a go at my weaknesses when I want, knowing that Steve would basically fix anything that, that I wasn't good enough at. So I could. You know, Steve would do a lot of the, or all of the profit and loss yeah. sort of work, but then I could just mess around and ask questions and learn as I go. So the the best way I liken it to is like, I could focus on my strengths and on my weaknesses, I could just keep taking the same exam again and again and again until I got the grade that I wanted. Because I could just try again, fail, try, fail, yeah. try, fail, try, fail. Yeah, because I think like right now, one of the things I'm struggling with in the business is this thing of, do we hire people with experience? Because right now, our team is very young. Yes. We're, it's a, like, yeah. and... I've kind of brought brought them on for, in in, in that ap apart from I think apart from Christian our editor like yeah. no one on the team is like I think better than me at doing the thing because it's like I've I was doing the thing initially and then I delegated to them mm -hmm. and that was sort of out of necessity at the start when we didn't have much money and didn't mm -hmm. have much revenue coming in and so you have to kind of get people on the cheap as it yeah. were like at entry level positions yeah but now that we're a bit more profitable it's a thing of what my business coach says is you really want to hire, for example, a managing director or like a marketing director or a director of operations mm -hmm. who has five, 10 years experience because you won't know what that is like. But when you have the right person there, it will just yeah. be like such a breath of fresh air. Yeah, you want you want the I, I'm a firm believer you want the opposite true. You want everyone in their respective area to be better than you are. And mm -hmm. you just amalgamate those people and, you know, look at longer term strategies and visions and, you know, build a cohesive team. Okay. But like, if you're the best editor in the business, then the business is only as scalable as you are. Yeah. If you're the best, okay. do you know what I mean? You need to be able to really think about that. And then when it comes to like, let's say we were to bring someone in with experience and they would sort of come in at a level above other people who've been in the business for the last two years. Mm -hmm. How 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 do you deal with that? Like, it was that like weird? weird Very for you? difficult. Yeah. Very difficult because what tends to happen as well is like people will come in and they'll be there from the start and that's an incredible thing to do and some of them will be able to grow with the business and some of them won't and it's not a, you know it, it's not negative or positive on mm -hmm. them it's just the way it is and like reading between the lines it sounds like your your business is it's elevating itself up a level and mm -hmm. anyone that's into football will, will know that teams that get promoted from the championship to the premiership generally try and hold on to the spine of the team and the core of the team. But ultimately, there's a lot of changes that have to happen for that team to then succeed in the champ in the Premier League. It's very rare. A championship team gets promoted to the Premiership and succeeds by maintaining the same team. So it sounds like you're almost the mm. championship team yeah. getting promoted <laughs> to the Premier League and you need to. And by the way, it's not experience doesn't necessarily mean competency. Yeah. So I wouldn't sort of, I'd try and separate those two things. Okay. And sometimes experience in certain areas can actually be a negative because then if they've done or if someone's done something in a particular way for a prolonged period of time it can be often very difficult and time consuming to try and move them out of their set ways so i would be cautious about that um but ultimately you need to understand like i don't know pick five key facets of the business and then you need individuals that are better than you in every single one of those facets and by the way it takes a long time and it's yeah. very difficult it's heartbreaking it's gut-wrenching yeah. it's filled with horrible conversations you will never want to have. Yeah. But if you manage to do it, you as an individual will be incredible, mm. incredibly competent and brilliant at so many different things. And the business and the team will be great in the sum of its parts. Nice. Okay, yeah, that's a dream. Um, so one thing I was gonna ask you about, like you often hear, for example, tennis players that win Wimbledon at the age of 23 mm -hmm. and now they've like made it and now there's no, like they could kind of get a, a bit depressed because you know, that's the pinnacle. Like, yeah. What more do you go for? Do you feel like you're in the position of having one Wimbledon at 23? <laughs> I was really scared of that. Like, yeah. legit, no, no word of a lie. I was really scared because <clears throat> what we did is when we, when we, 
when we did this deal and General Atlantic came in and helped tidy up the shareholding, I did, I essentially, I earned, you know, I earned good money I, and I, I've done okay. And I, I earn really good money now. And I was scared that, oh, okay, so there is a point now, I'm at a point now where I'm going to be completely candid. I, I don't, you know what I mean? I don't need to work. Yeah. I could comfortably retire happily. And I was really scared that when that happened, that I would lose the hunger, genuinely. And I was really open-minded with myself that I would react accordingly to however I felt. Um, but I am absolutely buzzing that I'm more hungry now than I've ever been to the mm. point where I have to really carefully control the amount of work that I take on because I'm still prone to, I will just take on the work, take on the work, take on the work. And like genuinely, I was I was worried about that. Why do you think it is that you're more hungry than you were? No okay. idea. Okay. I think, no. So first and foremost, I do think I, it might not be, but it could be something to do with it being an eight. Grandparents run their own business. Mm. My parents are so ridiculously hard working. Like they will like, I'm, I speak to my grandparents about it. They work and they work and they work. Mm. Um, I also think, and I'm really driven by this, I'm driven by the team that I work with and I want to do well for them and I want them to do well and I want them to succeed. I also think we've got a once in a lifetime opportunity. Mm. So I don't think, certainly in our generation, there's never been a brand that has had the opportunity to go from being you know, a local brand or a national brand to a truly mm. global brand. Um, and one of the greatest brands in the world. Mm. And I think we've got that opportunity. And I'd feel I would kick myself in 30, 40 years, 50 years time, if we didn't do everything within our power to become one of the greatest brands on the planet. Okay, so it sounds like, uh, it's, it, it sounds like even from the start, like money wasn't a particular motivator for you. No, I mean, listen, it certainly helps and money yeah. gives you choice completely. But the reason that the business was started was I wanted to be involved in fitness. Mm. The reason, or one of the reasons now, it's around, I think we've got the chance to genuinely improve the world, improve people's lives. And I'm fortunate, right? I've traveled the world and I've met individuals that the brand has impacted and mm. it's genuinely brought me to tears at times. It's incredible, that feeling. And I want more of that and I want it to impact more people. And, and ultimately, 16-year-old Ben walked into the gym and he didn't know what to do and he was massively self-conscious and skinny and felt very alone mm. and the, the thought of being able to take that away from other people and give them a community an area to learn a product that makes them feel like superman i think is amazing what really strikes me about you and on like on on the on the, in the interviews i've seen and on your youtube channel and mm. stuff is that you seem to like genuinely breathe the passion for the business mm. because i guess if i imagine another kind of billion dollar business like for example for example they would have like their vision, they would have like their model for, oh, we want to make the world a better place by doing X. Yes. And it can always feel a bit hollow because it's just like a corporate promise on their website. Yeah. But it sounds like you genuinely, like that is love, the thing that drives you. Gen genuinely love it. Like I said, I've stood in outside, I've been to every event that we've done, like yeah. all of the large scale events, I've traveled the world and I've met people that have lost weight, built muscle, improved their mental health. And I mean, I said at the start, like the product that we built at the start was, it was for a selfish reason. It's because I wanted that product. And mm -hmm. I, now it is, it, I don't know, it's, I think because I've had that experience myself of not knowing what to do, not being in a great place, and I've felt the positive effects mentally and physically of fitness, I would love other people to experience it. So yeah, it, it just, it really resonates with me. Sick. I'm excited That's to hear nice. more about your business, cool. by the way. I want to see yeah. the structure you've drawn. Oh yeah, I'll show you. <laughs> I'm fascinated by what it will look like. Yeah, it's a... Uh... <laughs> It's pretty simple, but it's like before it was so like kind of all over the place, and now Ooh. it feels a bit more streamlined. Because um, your, in many ways, your well, your business model is, or it feels to me more pioneering than what we're doing. Because at least we've got we can lean back on retailers, mm. sportswear brands, tech brands, all these different things, and amalgamate it into a structure. I wouldn't know where to start with you. Yeah, I mean the the, the thing I've I'm I'm looking at recently is. Uh, like TV and film production companies, okay. Because ours is kind of a production company, right? Um, and like, what does it look like? And in fact, the new org chart, like before, the way it was it was organized was, I was thinking, all right, well, there's me, and then we've got like Angus, who's in charge of like the YouTube channel. We've got Gareth, who's in charge of like the website. Yeah, mm -hmm. in charge of this, uh, sort of splitting things up based on the platform. Right, so basically, channel split. But yeah, right? basically yeah. channel split. Yeah. Whereas now. I think what makes much more sense is splitting it like a production company would in terms of pre-production, production, post-production. Post -production. Yeah. So pre-production is all of the idea generation and the writing. Yeah. Production is uh, 
me and a videographer, which is currently Angus, mm -hmm. <laughs> who's also a director of operations. Um, and then post-production is our editing team. Yeah. And just having that structure, it's like, oh, okay, whether it's, it's a YouTube video we make or a tweet thread or a blog post mm -hmm. or even me writing my book or an online course or anything like that, it all has that pre-production, production, post-production. Post -production. And therefore, if we've got Angus as director of operations managing that, then theoretically, I can give a vision through our marketing team or directly to our operations saying, hey, I want to make a course about this thing. Yeah. Here is my vision for it. Let's make it happen. Yeah. And then it goes through that kind of pipeline of pre-production, production, post-production, post in theory. And is it all, so none of it's hardware, as it were, it's all software or it's content, it's all online, yeah, not sort of tangible. We have a new, like, have we got our productivity plan? <laughs> I don't know, over there. We're launching a, a line of stationery. Go on. This was a, you're getting a sneak peek. This is like the proof versions. This is the uh, part-time productivity planner. <laughs> so so why, why part-time productivity? What does that mean? Uh, uh, part-time productivity is that, so I think one of the problems, again, I'm solving a selfish problem. One thing problem. I learned today. Yeah. <laughs> That's like, uh, where have I heard that before? Is that like the Benjamin Franklin sort of thing? Uh, quite, yeah, I think a lot I've of people- seen his thing. Yeah. Um, this is cool. Like what, one of the issues I have with these sorts of planners is that when they've got dates in them, yeah. and if I miss a date, then yeah. I just get so demotivated and then I will never ever use the planner again and yeah. it's going to go in the bin. Yeah. So this one, crucially, does not have any dates on it. So you can use it some days, you don't have to use it every day. Yeah. But every seven days it gives you a weekly review. It says, all right, just reflect on your week. And that might not actually be every seven days because you might not actually fill it in for seven days, but yeah. it's, it's better than not doing any kind of reflecting at all. And you've got a might do list as well, which are quite nice. What? I've never seen that before. Might do, yeah. I don't like to do lists because it feels like, you know, I'm being a slave to my to do list. Yeah. Whereas if I call it a might do list because it's like, oh, I could do this stuff if I wanted to. And yeah. then I feel more optimistic, like, yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? I like that. That's um, cool. Yeah. Amazing. So we're doing like a line of, line of stationery, these sort of like, daily to-do list pads if yeah. they do it instead. Oh, I was going to ask you about this. So uh, th these are some of my mantras, like journey before destination. Mm -hmm. It's it's the climb from Miley Cyrus. Yeah. Um, and the theme, the, the kind of theme of the book that I'm writing is yeah. that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's core message is that productivity and getting things done is not really about working harder. Mm -hmm. um, and like the, the real secret, if there is one, is to learn to enjoy the journey of what you're doing. Yes. Because when you're having fun, then productivity takes care of itself. Yeah. I was going to ask you, does that resonate with you? And do you have any examples from your life where yeah. having fun has led to productivity? <laughs> yes. So what, so for me, it's split into two distinct areas. Things I love doing yep. and I genuinely like adore. And now, by the way, all, so within Gymshark, within the, under the heading of Gymshark, because I love Gymshark so much, I would do anything within Gymshark because I just love it. And yep. I love the fact that it, it speaks back to the greater sort of mission. Now within that, Spend a day in product, love to. Fly yeah. over to a factory all day, go to an event, love it, meet people, do you know what I mean? Meet athletes, all that, absolutely adore every, se every second of it. Now, would I spend my Sunday afternoons looking at operational strategies, profit and loss thing, do you know what I mean? Accountancy, finance stuff. No, I probably wouldn't. Under the banner of Gymshark, then I again, then sort of get extra enjoyment from it. The, the thing that's really helped me massively to motivate me to do the things in that, that second bucket of, things I probably wouldn't enjoy as much is having the overarching an overarching goal. Yeah. So again, when I had this thing in my in my sort of sight of I want to be a CEO. Okay, a CEO needs to understand the customer, the product and the brand. Fine. Got it sorted. But also needs to understand finance and logistics for mm -hmm. example. So because I had this one it sat under the banner of Jim Shark and two I had this broader goal of I want to be a chief exec, it gave me huge motivation to do those things. And all of a sudden, it was just so easy for me to spend hours on end learning about them because it spoke back to a goal that I had. Oh, okay. So, so like, I think I have to have an aim. I have to have a reason for doing things. I'm not just going yeah. to learn about something for the sake of learning about it that I don't enjoy, Okay. which I would do with other things. Yeah. Interesting. So like having that kind of purpose, that meaning behind the yes. thing that you're doing makes the thing more fun. Yeah. And then so what I did was I said, I want to be a CEO, I need to do X, Y, and Z. And then I would, I wouldn't, I've never been good at just like battering something for like 12 hours straight. I would have to do just a little thing every single day. And then having that, that goal in my head, like the best example I can give was, I want to be a CEO, I'm terrible at public speaking. So I need to be, I need to get better at public speaking. Mm -hmm. It's like one of my things was literally public speaking. And then I sort of navigate through life and as I'm at an event, whatever, on the tube, chatting to people as you go, oh, what do you do for a living? I spoke to someone and they're like, oh, I'm a public speaking coach. And normally I'd be like, 
it, you know, if I didn't have the goal, it would be yeah. nice, have a lovely day, see you soon. But because I had this goal and it was in my list, I'm like, oh my God, I'd love to be great at public speaking. Can I take your number? Can we chat some more? Can I learn from you? So this is why I think it's so important to have that goal because then I think it helps with self-development. Mm. So I think it's like, if you don't aim at something, you can't, I, I just don't think you can get that. You can't just meander through life and expect to be something. Like, yeah. you can't just, you know, roll around and expect to be a Premier League footballer. The Premier League footballers are Premier League footballers because they've worked every single day and they've dedicated their lives to it. So I think it's the same with... Mm any endeavor and that's how I try to dedicate my learning now have you have you, have you come across this, the the law of attraction kind of stuff I, I, no I've heard about it but I don't really know yeah so it's it's the, the there was this book called the secret that was published I, th I think a few decades ago that like went viral <laughs> back in the day and the whole principle behind the law of attraction mm -hmm. is that um, it's about like manifestation that if you if you really set a goal if you really believe something mm -hmm. then the, the the law of attraction in the universe will like make it happen for you. Yeah. Then it kind of goes a bit overboard that, you know, if you've got cancer and you believe you don't have cancer, then it will get cured magically. You know, the only reason you're poor is because you just don't believe enough it's that you're rich. It's It's all, yeah, it's, it's very, very wishy-washy. <laughs> um, but I think there is some truth to this stuff in that when you manifest, when you, when, when you have a goal, like I want to become the CEO, mm -hmm. you start seeing the opportunities yeah. that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. You, you see what you look for, don't you? Like the public speaking thing, mm -hmm. or, you know, when I decided I wanted to buy a Tesla, suddenly I started seeing Teslas everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. Because <laughs> you just have that thing, and so your brain turns on to the, the, the various options here. So I think that's really cool. No, honestly, I'm a massive, massive advocate for that. I think just whatever it is, just set, set an aim. And, and the thing is that's been really powerful for me is I haven't gone, I want to be a CEO, so I'm going to do these massive things like set the bar so low. And it's only now looking back, I've realized mm. everything I've ever wanted to do, I've set the bar low. So Gymshark was started because I wanted to be involved in fitness. The website was built because I wanted a website that would transact. I didn't mm. go, I want a multi-billion dollar business that's one of the greatest brands in the world. It was just those really little things. And by setting the bar low, it then you know allows you to take those baby steps because Nothing great is achieved in a short in the short term. It's over prolonged periods of constant yeah. progression. Okay. So what's your what's your kind of low bar now these days now that you're now that you're CEO? Honestly, um, consistency. Okay. That's my biggest thing at the moment. I just want to be consistent. Steve gave me some advice coming into the chief exec role. Was he said you just have to be consistent. So I was absolutely knackered yesterday. I went and watched the football on Sunday. Traffic coming out of Wembley was an absolute nightmare. I had about three hours sleep. And I went in and I said, if I do one thing today, it is I'm going to be consistent through the day. And I don't want anyone that sort of to notice that Ben is really tired today or whatever. Yeah. I want to be consistent. So that's my that's my low bar. Sick. Um, all right, a few, a few more kind of random unconnected things that I mm -hmm. want to talk to you about. So you're kind of like a celebrity now mm -hmm. in... I wouldn't like, say that. But oh well, I know you know, what you mean. you're like famous in like. What are the perks of that? Like, do you get cool stuff for being you? Um, like, yeah. You get to meet amazing people, like really, really cool people. Like, like this never would have happened. Like, this is this is like a massive pro for me. Meeting, I mentioned a guy called Ajars earlier. Like, I get to meet really, really cool people, and like, so it's you've got the the public world. So the thing I love about YouTube and podcasting, mm. right, is it gives the mass audience access to conversations that they would never normally have access to. And that's great. But then there's a huge group of people, probably the vast majority of very talented people that don't really want to be on camera, don't mm. really want to do the whole YouTube public facing thing. They just are quite happy to do their own thing. I get to speak to a lot of those people as well. That's really cool because oftentimes that's where you, like, I personally learn so much from. Yeah. And like I'm trying to, I'm my sort of self development at a point where it's very niche, the specific things that I'm trying to learn. And mm. so again, I'm now coming into this CEO role. I'm trying to find other people that have done a similar scale role, have, have had different pro similar problems to me. Mm. So that the, the amount of people is, is significantly smaller. So I would say access is amazing. Um, and choice, like you get, you do get a lot of choice within reason, okay. which is great. So access is then you, you could just like email, like I don't know, call a people, Phil Knight right? and be like, like bro, <laughs> probably not, probably not him. But do you know what I mean? Like within yeah. within the UK, there's yeah. so many amazing people that I've met, and it's yeah. and it's so cool. Like, um, I I got to a few years ago, I got to go and spend time on Downing Street. Like mm. I never thought that would be possible. It was it was life changing for me to walk through the gates and see that because it was just something I never thought was possible. And those sorts of things are, you know, I find them really inspiring. Nice, that's cool. Um, why did you start the YouTube channel? I started the YouTube channel. This is, so basically, I was very happy 
to not be the public facing face of the brand. Very happy to do that. And anyone that's followed the story will know for the first five or six years, I just wouldn't have really posted anything online. Now I took loads of content, loads of pictures, loads of videos, and I never posted them. And then all of a sudden, like the core people started to understand and know who I was and what I was doing at the business. And a lot of people would ask, a lot of people would ask, a lot of people would ask. And then I was in Dublin once and a, and a lad came up to me and he said, I'm doing a, I'm doing a, something written, a written piece on Jim Sharp for, I think it was a degree, it was like mm. a dissertation. And he said, can you just give me an overview, a video on how Jim Sharp started? Um, I said, oh, I don't really want to do it. I've been asked before. And he said, come on, just one video. That's mm. it. Like, it's what? A couple of hours of your time sort of thing. Um, but I couldn't really say no. And I, I, I hate I hate lying. I don't want to ever sort of make a promise that I can't keep. And I said, you know what? Fine, I will do it. Um, I recorded it two or three times, ended up deleting the footage. And then my my now fiance at the time, girlfriend was a YouTuber, so she knew how to do it all. So she was like, right, sit there. I'm putting the camera on a tripod. I'm going to record you talking. And then she would basically edit mm -hmm. edit it for me. Um, so we put that live um, and it just completely blew up. The reaction was amazing. And it was weird because it was like, it was big on YouTube, which is cool. And it was big on Facebook and Instagram and all the social networks. Then all of a sudden, like, newspapers would start writing about it and it sort of went into that world as well and i just kept doing it ever since really okay because yeah it, it, like this is an area in, in which i think like th there are so many like really cool companies and really cool like founders and ceos of those companies mm. but you never really hear from them unless they're being interviewed on a podcast yeah and so the fact that you have got your own youtube channel where you're showing the behind the scenes of like just the insane warehouse setup you guys have mm -hmm. and like how Shopify works with you for Black Friday. It's all just so inspiring and so cool to see because you never get that behind the scenes. Well, it's important to me because, so I mean, similar to yourself, right? I, I love the thought of people being better in the business that they're working in, starting new businesses yeah. and being entrepreneurial and creative. I, I love that. I'm really passionate about it. So I, th I, I, I thought like no one else shows the, in, the inside of a multi-billion dollar brand. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, why don't we do that? Why don't we show people like, you know, there are things that we will mention and will it give a competitor an opportunity to do something quickly? Yes, it probably will. But yeah. in the grand scheme of things, for me, the idea of inspiring people mm. to build businesses, start businesses and be better in themselves is is incredibly fulfilling. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. Um yeah, uh, every every time I see that you you put out a new video, I always get excited. Like yes, because <laughs> I I find that like y you're operating at a level of scale that I can't even imagine, and mm. the fact that you're making it public means that I can now sort of imagine that level of scale. Mm -hmm. I think it was similar to um, when I first started listening to podcasts and things like the Tim Ferriss Show and, yes. and stuff like that. See, hearing people yeah. like Gary Vaynerchuk, mm -hmm. where these guys are operating at a level that most of us just don't even know exists. Oh, it's amazing. And, and then, you talk about yeah. productivity. Those guys operate on mm. a level that I didn't even think was possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, and I'm hoping that with this kind of podcast, I can... It's a pretty good excuse to like hang out with someone, meet mm -hmm. someone, have a long conversation. Um, another thing I was going to ask about is that, you know, as, as Gymshark has gotten, has gotten bigger, yeah. you know, as like, you know, as a YouTube channel gets bigger, you start, get, you start to get haters, you start mm -hmm. to get negative comments. I guess you sort of, BuzzFeed has, has, has had this issue where people working at BuzzFeed or working for BuzzFeed will then make a, a think piece of why I left BuzzFeed, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. How does that stuff make you feel? Like, how do you, how do you deal with the... Yeah, so there, there's a point where, like, the whole thing of leaving Gymshark, yeah. posting it on YouTube, it would, like, get yeah, massive yeah, viral. Everyone, yeah. everyone wanted to hear about it. Um, listen, it's going to happen. Yeah. I just think... I think, so the thing is, especially being in my position, I mm. guess I'm public facing. I'm not massively public facing. There are people that are far more so. But just growing a business, it's so incredibly tough. I just feel like I've been beaten with a stick around the head so many times now. You just mm. sort of get used to it. Um, you know, I've been on the receiving end of, you know, people sending me messages on social media, personally, in person difficulties in the business the growth phase like yeah it it's it's part and parcel of the job um i also by the way think that in the long term it's a very positive thing because i feel like i'm held to a high level of account um and i think that only makes me and the business better
Uh, health and life, I love account as in... Because on social media, anyone can call anyone out, right? Yeah. And if there's validity to the claim, then publicly people are going to know about it. Whereas maybe in yesteryear, in my parent yeah. generation, you, you would find, or you'd look back and you'd realise companies or individuals would do bad yeah. things and sort of get away with them. And I think it's great now that people can hold individuals and businesses to account online. Mm. Um, granted, sometimes it can go too far and like cancel culture, I'm massively against. I think people need to look at things with a logical set of mm. eyes. Um, and like I said, you know, for me, sometimes it is very, very tough, but I think I'm putting myself out there. I'm saying I want to be the CEO of a, of a large business and a business that's in many ways at the center of a culture and a community. And to do that, you have to have a, a thick skin and, you know, you have to be doing the right things. And nice. I think I'm, I, I think I will do those. Mm. Cool. Um, I guess final, final thing I want to ask about, like, what is your, what's your workflow for video production <laughs> with, well, with, with like, the James team? James, <laughs> more than me, varies, it varies, it varies a lot, right? So sometimes yeah. we'll have an idea, again, so the CEO video we saw, obviously we saw coming well in yeah. advance, um, and we said we need to do this video, we want it to be special. We actually recorded it a few times and bin the footage because I was terrible, basically, I was <laughs> okay. not very good on camera. Um, I didn't, I just, to be honest, it was quite an emotional subject for me, and my yeah. words just weren't, it, I wasn't, even speaking in coherent sentences. So um, that one, we'll all sit in a room and work together. There are certain things which are more like Paul, i.e. Some, pe some people will message us and say, can you make this content? Sometimes I'll jump on Instagram and say, what would you like to see? People will message yeah. me. Uh, we've got someone who's brilliant called Lily and the team yeah. who will build a, out a brief. So you'll start with title and thumbnail. So that's something I was told actually a, a long time ago mm. by um, a guy called Jon Olsen that we used to work oh, with. Oh, yeah. Nice. And... Um, <laughs> And I said I asked him the same question, and yeah. he said, "I always start with title and thumbnail." Nice, yeah, that's what we did a lot. Now. <laughs> if you don't click yeah. on the title of the thumbnail, then yeah. you, you can make the best video in the world, but no one's going to watch it. Mm. Um, so we start with the title and the thumbnail, with the the purpose of the video, what do we want to get across? And now, just because of how busy the role is, I'll have a, a brief, and I'll sort of read through the brief. Oh, okay, so people want to see this video. Um, I'll be sat down on a chair, and we'll we'll record basically. Okay. And then all of the drone footage, all of the time lapses of the warehouses, is that all done yeah, by, this James by James? James Perry, who is an absolute <laughs> wizard. Absolute <laughs> wizard. Life changing. Me and James have been working together for, what, two years now? Two, two and a half. Two yeah. years. And um, yeah, it's been absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Listen, I, early days, I edited my own videos. So Robin did editing. I then learned to edit. She taught me. Mm. Um, it was very time consuming editing. I remember there was videos I'd spend 8, 12, 15 hours editing yeah. and it just wasn't an efficient use of time. And by the way, I wasn't even that good at it. Mm. Then worked with other people and, and James came in and just revolutionized the channel. So what's it like having someone film everything you do? Weird at first, but then you yeah. get used to it. And like me and James are mates anyway. Like, okay. So the biggest thing when I was looking for someone to work with, yeah. it's almost like, can you, you know, can you edit? Can you work a camera? Great. But like, it needs to be someone that we get along with. Yeah. Um, COVID's obviously changed things, but we travel the world together. We've been to the States, been to mm. Hong Kong. We would, we you know, be around the UK all the time. We spend a lot of time together. Yeah. So we have to get on with each other and be comfortable with each other. Because um, if I'm rigid on camera or he doesn't yeah. like me, then, it, you know, it doesn't yeah, work particularly well. Yeah, a problem, isn't it? <laughs> What about like, do you, do you film like literally everything? Like what if you're like having dinner with friends or like... So we wouldn't film that, would we? Yeah. It would be anything sort of extracurricular would tends to get filmed. Any yeah. trips will all be filmed. Um, we'll normally have a filming slot every week okay. um, where we'll sit down and talk to camera. We'll occasionally, so James was looking at, um, you're going to record for an entire month, were you basically completely, which is going to be really fun for me. Um, <laughs> so we're going to do an entire month. Yeah. What we'll use of that, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, people love the day in the life. They love. Yeah, it's like, so we, we, We've yeah. done some really cool, high, almost high budget professional things. And then we do wander around with a camera for a day and people just love that. So yeah. we want to bring people a little bit more sort of in behind the scenes. Nice. And do you just wear the microphone at all, at all times as well? Just yeah, tend yeah, to, yeah. Yeah, you sort of get so, used to it. So then James ends up with like hundreds of gigabytes of footage yeah, every, every day. Yeah, that's the problem. That, the, yeah. genuine, that was another problem, wasn't it, during COVID? Because then I would have my camera and I would film at home. And I didn't realise just how big the footage is yeah, nowadays. Enormous, when yeah. you're recording in yeah. 4K, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes. Well, I would have to drive to yours with the hard drive, wouldn't I? Like, <laughs> yes. give, you the, give you the hard drive with all the footage on because it was just too slow on our home internet. Yeah, so we, we we did this whole thing where uh, up, so uh, we've got two editors in Romania, mm -hmm. and Romania has ridiculously fast internet speeds. Everyone's on yeah. like one like a thousand megabytes per second, like yeah. upload download, 
and the instant internet speed in this place was like 20 meg upload download mm -hmm. and it was just physically impossible to upload files yeah so i got like the most expensive bt infinity option i found this guy to kind of wire the the router from over there wire it around the house yeah. <laughs> so it feeds into this laptop over here yeah so we use that to upload files now then, so what is your workflow it. like? So you record your videos yep. and then you send them out to be edited in Romania, basically. Basically, yeah. And then and then you'll comment, I'd assume, because it's never going to be perfect first time or how does that work? Yeah, so for the first two years, I was I would, there was a random review where I would comment on things. We uploaded to a website called Frame.io where you can like... Yeah. We do a Frame.io. <laughs> Frame.io is yeah. great. Um, affiliate link in the video description if we can forget one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but now, like recently, Christian, who's my main, main editor and who was yeah. employee number one, he, he said that, hey, you know, me, me reviewing footage is always a bit of a bottleneck. Yeah. Because if I'm out, then, you know, whatever. He was like, is there any need for you to review it? Mm -hmm. I had a thought about it. I was like, no, you're right. There isn't really any need for me to review it. Mm -hmm. And so now video, videos come out twice a week. And Angus is like, oh, yeah, we've got, we, we've got videos come out. I'm like, oh, yeah. I can't even remember which one that was because we filmed it three weeks ago. Yeah. And we're getting into this, like, production See, that's cool. That's really production cool, company mindset. That. Um, and I think one of the things that, that resonated with, with, with what you said is finding finding people and building systems to combat your own weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So my weakness, ironically, is that I suck at motivating myself to film videos when I'm on my own. Really? Uh, and it, it always felt felt like such a such a heavy lift. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, work, I'd give myself, I don't know, five hours to film a video and I'd procrastinate for four and a half and then I'd film it right at the end. No way. Um, I wouldn't expect that of you. Yeah, mate. <laughs> it, like, I think when I was working full time, I had to film a video in two hours in the evening. Because you so had yeah, to be, like, Parkinson's law, you know, yeah. wake up early before going on call, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But when I took a break from medicine intending to travel the world, yeah. which then didn't happen because of COVID, mm -hmm. that's like, I've got the whole day to film a video. Yeah. And then it takes the whole day to film one video. Yeah. So now every Thursday we have a filming day where Angus comes over is behind the camera and it's like, all right, Ali, chop, chop, come on, let's do another yeah. one, let's do another one, let's do the thumbnails. And that's been really good. It's just so nice working with other people. So how does that work creatively then? Like video ideas, thumbnails, obviously titles. How does that work? Yeah, so we've got a team. So we have um, every every Monday we have like a content editorial meeting right. with me, Angus, our writers. And everyone rocks up to that meeting with three ideas for videos. Yeah. So titles, thumbnails, and talking points. Mm. And then I would look through them with Angus and we would give them the green light. Be like, really like that one. Don't really like this one. Here's some feedback about that one. And they would work on the video idea, the concept for the next week. And the yeah. following Monday, we'd have like the full video basically ready. Yeah. And then I would kind of go through it to be like, okay, if I were actually filming this based on these points, you know, I'd add a story about my life over there, a Harry Potter reference over there, we'll put a story from medicine over there. Mm -hmm. And then the video is ready to film. Yeah. So that when it comes to Thursday, we can bang, 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 film four videos in a day. So when you say like bang, 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 are you talking... Would they? Would what would you? What would it look like to you? So someone else has come up with an idea. Are you having a script? Are you having key messages? Are you just having a title? What does that look like? Yeah. So title, thumbnail, and talking points. Okay. So bullet points. I don't like reading from a script. Yeah. It feels very inauthentic and uh, yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a nightmare. Impossible. Um, so I just like bullet points. And the team, like over time, like they've they've seen all my videos, and so they know what examples from my life I could use for different things. Let's say we're talking about imposter syndrome. Yeah. Someone, they will have written, oh, you can talk about when you were directing the hospital pantomime. Yeah. I was like, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I, I can talk about that. And mm -hmm. it feels really weird and nice that people know my life so well that they can tell me what examples I'm yeah, going to be using amazing. for stuff. Because that's, that's the thing that always fascinates me. So like, is like scalability because ultimately you are one person and if yeah. you're going to be recording, then they'll always, the guys will always need you. So yes. I'm really interested to see how that sort of becomes scalable? Or do you yeah. do it through all the different arms of the business and the channels and, you know, the products and things like that? Yeah, so the thing that, the the, the, the vision I set for us, I think it was this time two years ago, I wrote it on, on a page in Notion being like, mm -hmm. basically, I want us to get to a point where the only thing I'm having to do is talk to a camera. Yeah. Because I think that's the only aspect of the business in which I add unique value in being me. Yeah. Uh, to an extent in like idea generation, but like even even that, yeah. Can, ease, can be outsourced to someone who's, who's, who's good at it. And so now we're actually pretty close to that point where the only, really, the only thing I really do for the YouTube channel is talk to a camera once a week. Um, what I didn't realize at the time is that being kind of the CEO kind of role is actually mostly about having meetings with people and yeah, <laughs> organizational clarity and setting vision, setting yeah. goals and tracking metrics and, and stuff. Hiring, hiring is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking to hire five more people and that's been such a bottleneck for me because we have no process for hiring. We've just yeah. been making making it up as we went along. Mm -hmm. And now I've discovered there's all these like platforms like Workable and stuff where you can post a job description and they will do the applicant tracking and stuff. 
rather yeah, than a Google, a Google form, yeah. which is what we used before. And so that's kind of where we ended up, like once a week for the YouTube channel. But the thing I love about your setup, and when you mentioned you were going to bring the videographer, I was like, mm -hmm. yes, because what I'm imagining is I would love to have a James who can like travel with me, especially as I want to travel around the world and stuff. Yeah. And often I find that in conversations with the team or in conversations with friends asking for advice about anything, yeah. I even just come out with bangers and I'm like, oh, I, I yeah, wish someone wish I wish that that were here to film this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. That's cool. So, That's really cool. But yeah, like I said, for me, um, the fact that we get on is massive. You should genuinely, you should come to Gymshark though. You should look around our studios because yeah. granted it's slightly different, but then we'll have the full creative sort of suite and team. Um, I think you'd love it. Sick. We're actually looking for a studio to film an online course about productivity. Come and have a look. Can we do it? Can, genuinely, come and have a look. Sick. So we've got like, the, we've got all the e comm studios and we've got yeah. something called Studio X, which is basically an innovation studio. We would okay. build full gym sets in there. So there's, yeah. um, there's campaigns we've done where you've got like people in the gym, yeah. but it, what, they're not actually in a gym. The whole thing's just been built in that studio. Nice. So okay, that's really cool. You should definitely come and have a look. <laughs> yeah, because my personal trainer at the moment, he's got like a home gym in his garage. Mm -hmm. And so we've sort of been filming a bit of content for the Instagram there. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. come and have a look. You'd love it. We've done, we've got all the studios. We've got the podcast studio. Yeah. Um, it's it's absolutely brilliant because similar to you, to what you do is like we we consider content as much of a product as you know as yeah. this top. It's it's exactly the same. Um, so content's massive for us. Mm. Yeah, I think I don't I don't know any other any other brand in your thing that does content as well as you guys do. Mm. It's like most of them just don't do content. They do like expensive advertising campaigns that run a single video and that's it. Like, yes, yeah. I know. And like it's I think it's just because it's been it's been the lifeblood of the business since day one. And I think growing up. Like, yeah, I'd watch TV, I'd watch sort of match of the day and stuff. But beyond that, everything was on YouTube and it was mm. all content. And all of a sudden, when you realize that you can play your part in that, it just, yeah, you end up building a business around and a brand around that content and community. Nice. Um, nothing about that. So you, who are who are the kind of mentors through either in real life, books, podcasts, who have inspired you over the years um, and people should check out? So I don't have like a defined group of mentors and I don't have people that I will regularly check in with as a mentor. I know some people at Gymshark will do that and it seemed to work really well for them. Um, Steve and Paul, who were the, the sort of original people that helped professionalize the business in the early days, um, have been massive to me. I've got a lot of friends. Again, I keep mentioning Ajars, mm. one of the most inspiring people I've met and like a very creative CEO. He's not a CEO as you would sort of expect. Um, Harley at Shopify, I'll sort of lean on occasionally if I if I have a problem that I don't know how to solve. Mm. Uh, online, I'll I'll watch anything. Can anyone like I, the thing is I'm a, I'm a massive believer that that you can learn something from every single person that you meet, and I mm. think I learn more from the amalgamation of meeting a thousand people than sort of one individual. And I'll try and chat to people that are good at specific things. There's not like one human who I think is the yeah. perfect human being. I'll try and pick things from so many different people. Nice. Um, and are there any kind of books, videos, podcasts that you kind of find yourself commonly recommending Ooh. to people if they were to ask you, oh, you know, Ben, how did how did you do X or things um, like Again, it's very similar. So yeah. I read um, a book ages ago, which I thought I would hate and I really liked. And I don't actually read that much. And it was called Poor Charlie's Almanac, which oh, was by yes. uh, Charlie Munger. Mm. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's yeah, not a book. It's like, like an amalgamation of speeches, of isn't stuff. it? Yeah. yeah. Um, which I thought was amazing. And there was yeah. one particular page, which I can just about remember, where I think it was on one, it was on what, either one or two page where he broke down the entire success of the Coca-Cola brand. I remember thinking, wow, this is amazing. And, and I went into this book thinking, he's an investor, he's a financier, we yeah. have nothing in common, he's an old bloke, old, do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, and I ended up thinking, wow, yeah. this is amazing, because he was very brand first. He's talk, he talks about lots of different sort of psychological models. And basically, mm. it's almost like, imagine you've got like a problem here, and it's about attacking this problem from a load of different angles in a load of different ways. And it's exactly the way that we and I try and solve problems at, at Gymshark and in life. So I found that book massively inspiring. And then, yeah, mulling around YouTube, I love your channel. You introduced <laughs> me to Notion. Notion, life, like yeah. genuinely life-changing. Um, we, I mean, we've run almost everything on Notion now, don't we, from a creative point in the entire, in, in the entire business, by the way, not just as in oh, me personally. Okay. I run, I think you you coined it like a life OS. Yeah. I have my life OS. I have a professional life. Yeah. The different Gymshark stuff, everything's run on Notion. So that was life changing. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's it. I just mull around nice. the internet. Jordan Peterson. I love oh, Jordan yeah. Peterson. I'm a massive, massive fan of him. I think he's brilliant. Um, he's really helped me as well. Yeah. Sick. 
Um, I'd love to check out your Notion setup behind the scenes. I was going to say, I, that's one of the things yeah. I thought, as, as we were driving down, <laughs> I, I wanted to see your Notion setup. setup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, That would be that would be pretty sick. Um, cool. And any sort of, let's say someone's watching this and they're thinking they're, they're, they want to get started being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Maybe they're sort of uh, late teens, early 20s, haven't really started anything yet, but yeah. really inspired by you and your journey. Mm -hmm. Any kind of advice um, you'd, you'd give? Yeah, I mean, it's fairly standard, right? You have to do what you love because otherwise you'll end up you'll end up giving up. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer now that there's no niche too small, like, mm -hmm. especially with the internet being so vast. I, mean, I always think, and it sounds stupid saying it now, if, if I'd have said as a kid, I want to be a professional gamer growing up, yeah. my mom would have been like, you are nuts. Whereas now, it's like a legitimate mm. sport, career, and everything in between. Like even, I guess, with yourself, it would have been so difficult for you to articulate what you yeah. do now yeah. as a kid. Yeah. I just think there's no niche too small. So I think whatever it is, double down on it and just genuinely give it a go. Like Gymshark was the seventh business website product mm. that I'd made and the other six failed miserably. Mm. Now, unfortunately, that's not a sexy story. So no one talks about the failed apps, mm. the failed websites. They only talk about the one that did well. And it's a consistent theme on everyone else that's successful that yeah. I've met. They've yeah. failed miserably so many times and they've been endlessly optimistic about it and they've just gone again and again and again. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that, like, I, I see this a lot with people starting YouTube channels, where yeah. there's this sense of, I have to get it right first time. Yeah. And if you look at the stats, like, the average YouTube channel takes 152 videos to get to 1,000 subscribers. And I, I get messages well. from people being like, you know, like, I, it, it took my channel 52 videos and six mm -hmm. months to hit the first 1,000 subscribers. And that was, like, a lot faster than the average. Yeah. And so I get messages from people, like, 10 videos in being like, oh, this YouTube thing isn't working. Keep just, going. like, you know, keep, keep going. going. Just, just try things, right? Just try keep trying out. new things. Like, I'm a, like incremental improvement, I think, is so, so, so important as well. But, yeah. Sweet. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. No, been, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Been a good chat. Good stuff. <laughs>